All right. So let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our now 16th iteration or so of the CMFI MassPEC seminar. So we, in round two, we moved on to protein mass spectrometry. And yeah, it's my great pleasure to have Professor Florian Meyer uh, give the lecture today. So uh, Florian studied uh, chemistry at the University of the Saarland in the very uh, southwest Germany before he yeah, went abroad for a little bit and then started his PhD with Matthias Mann at the Max Planck Institute in um, Munich, where I think he did quite some monumental work in uh, the realm of uh, shotgun proteomics, in particular about like uh, yeah new innovative uh, data acquisition strategies such as like PASEF, DIA PASEF, and also uh, Boxcar. I think he also did some uh, machine learning work with like collision cross sections. So there's some very cool uh, papers uh, from Florian, and uh, I've been a fan for a long time. Finally, we also met now, uh, at least on Zoom. Uh, and yeah, then uh, I think Florian did like a short postdoc before, also at the Max Planck Institute in Munich, before he then started his own lab, the functional proteomics lab at the University Hospital in uh, Jena. So, and yeah, I guess without doubt, he's one of the pioneers in uh, yeah, uh, proteomics data acquisition. So yeah, it's my great pleasure to have him uh, cover this topic today. And yeah, without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand over and I'm very much looking to forward to your talk, Florian. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, for the kind introduction, and it's really my my pleasure to to meet all of you, and at least be be virtually in in tubing, and talk about this this topic, which is really really close to my my heart. Um, so yeah, let's let's try to to keep this as interactive as as possible. Um, so yeah, there will be some some tasks and some some teasers where we'll. we'll um, push you to be a bit, bit active in this this workshop and uh, yeah hopefully we can just have a very nice nice discussion of of this this topic and let's see where, where all of this will will lead us um i guess many of you are more focused on on metabolites but now for the next one hour i want you to believe that really the next massive opportunity in, in science and according to the forbes magazine also in economy is in in proteomics because as this this author nicely describes, proteins are the building blocks of our of our life and even every living thing on earth. You know, it's the proteins that that allow you to listen and see this presentation now. And also the it's the proteins that allow you to to think about all the content in this presentation. So I think this is a beautiful picture of why we need proteomics. And what I found also very interesting in this article that the author raises the question, why am I only hearing about proteomics now? And I think it's not only mass spec based proteomics, but also other types of proteomics that, that really came into the market uh, recently. And I think one of the answers why this author didn't hear about proteomics before is because it's terribly complicated to measure the proteome. So it's maybe not as complicated as measuring the entire metabolome, but definitely much more challenging than, than measuring um, protein, uh, DNA or RNA sequences. So the learning objective for today is that I want you to understand the, the basic data acquisition methods in, that are used in proteomics. And you should also understand why these acquisition methods work and hopefully in the end you're also able to make a good judgment on which data acquisition method might be a good choice for your specific experiment so to get get started i would like to activate your your brains a bit and discuss the following three questions that i think have been covered already in the last lectures or in the last semester um so the stage is yours i think i give you one or two minutes to maybe just just 
recap these these questions and then it would be great if if one of you could just unmute, unmute and yeah give give the answers to the, these questions Okay, who wants to go first and tell us what is a mass spectrometer? It is allowed to use Google. <laughs> I think you can also just name random people here. <laughs> At least of like the top three one on my list, they should all know that. So Shane, <laughs> what, what have you learned here? Uh, well, a mass spectrometer is basically just a very fine uh, analytical balance that measures mass over charge of some sort of molecule or protein. Perfect. Yeah, the key is really we are measuring mass over charge. So we are looking at at ions. Uh, we have to before we can can analyze anything, we have to turn it into an, an ion. And yeah, once we have these ions, there's different types of mass spectrometers that we can can use. So can you give me maybe one or two? Yeah. Two names. Hello, I can answer probably. Yeah. And I would say that we could, it's possible to use orbit drop, um, mass spectrometry, oh, mostly, I believe, for uh, on target proteomics. Maybe it's, they are better, I don't know. And then also kit off, it's possible to use. Um, I don't know about others. Okay, cool. Oh, you you named exactly those two that are, I, I guess, most most popular in in the proteomics field. So it's it's the Orbitrap mass analyzer that I think revolutionized the the field since it was was launched well now more than ten years ago. And then uh, QTOFs have always been around and maybe are now see, seeing a bit of a of a re re emerge emerging. So. Cool, very nice. And then there is two things we can do with ions in the mass spectrometer. So I called it MS experiments. Um, can you can you think of what what I mean with this? Who's on there else? Maybe. Kishap. <laughs> do, do you have an idea which which um, experiments one can do with ions in the MUSPEC? Oh, sounds like there's a MUSPEC in your background. <laughs> well, uh, it's not, I don't know, maybe in proteomics, first we hydrolyze and then measure into the mass spectrometry is that well one, one thing is yes we, we measure the the mass and in particular the mass of the the intact peptides or, or proteins but if we don't or, or what yeah this so this is, would be one type of experiment looking at the intact ion what is the the other type Anna was trying to to raise the hand. Um, I didn't. You're not referring to top down or bottom up. Like, that's no, even mm -hmm. even even simpler. Do you mean targeted? Are we talking to? It's. <clears throat> 
what 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 I so for to do targeted or untargeted, you you're doing two things. So one of them is you look at the the mass of the the intact peptide in this case, or you could think of the mass of the intact metabolite. But then there is something else you can do if you want to get more information about this specific. Ah, it, it may be uh, MS1 and MS2. Uh, yes, before. perfect. Cool. <laughs> so this is really, I think, what we will need. And um, in the the rest of the, the seminar, we will go through these different points and, and see how they are used and, and useful in proteomics. So as we, we just discussed, we typically use QTOF instruments. And on the left, you see the instrument type that is used in, in our lab. So this is the, the Tim's stuff. And you see here in proteomics, it's typically coupled to an HPLC or more specifically a nanoflow HPLC. Then we have the chromatographic separation here in this, this front part here. And then we use electrospray to generate ions from the, the peptide molecules. <clears throat> and then we use all kinds of ion optical elements to guide the, the ions through our mass spectrometer. And in this case, they would go through the time of flight analyzer, which is pretty much just a very long tube. And the ions fly from here all the way up here and then down again. And the time of this flight is proportional to the M over Z of the ions, which gives us the end in the end, the, the mass spectrum that we are interested in. The alternative platform is shown here on the right. That is the, the Orbitrap platform. And in this case, it's also a hybrid mass spectrometer. So the Orbitrap is hybridized with a quadrupole mass filter. And we need this, this mass filter in particular for the MS2 experiments, where we would select specific ions of interest, um, guide them to the collision cell, or they then fragment with neutral gas molecules, and we, we mass analyze the fragment ions in the Orbitrap. So both platforms allow you to do both experiments, the MS1 experiment and the MS2 experiment. Now, if we now zoom out and see how this fits in the, the proteomics workflow, uh, one way to visualize this is kind of this, this circle here that starts from our sample of interest so in our case, that's mostly clinical samples, could be tissue samples, it could be body fluids, um, cell lines, you know, whatever you could, could think of. And in the very first step, we have to prepare these samples for, for analysis. And if you want to prepare samples for proteome analysis, the very first thing you have to do is to lyse the cells and extract the protein material from the cells. So in this picture, you would end up somewhere here. Um, where you have the proteins now in your in your vial, and you be, before we heard the term bottom up and top down proteomics, our preferred method is the bottom up approach, and in this case we would not stop at the proteome protein level, but perform a proteolytic digestion um, that that cuts our proteins into into peptides. The reason for that is that peptides are much easier to, to analyze than intact proteins. And you know, we can, for instance, use regular C18 reverse phase chromatography to get a nice separation of the, these complex peptide mixtures that then come out of this, this process. And then as we've seen before, um, we, we turn the, the peptides into ions and electrospray them in our mass spectrometer where we do perform these two experiments. So one of them is the MS1 experiment that gives us the mass of the, the intact peptide. And the second experiment we're doing is the MS2 experiment. And this is visualized here by you know, these, these intact uh, ions here with the, the pluses. <laughs> and in the, the MS2, they are fragmented. So we're looking at the fragments of these, these peptide ions. And indeed, it's the, the, the fragment pattern, the, the information about the fragment ions that tells us the sequence of the peptides and that allows us to identify peptides and hence uh, identify proteins, <clears throat> whereas the, the MS1 signal is often used for the, for the quantification. 
So that's why I highlighted these two levels because they're really omnipresent in, in proteomics experiments. Um, so quickly for the next next few minutes, I would like to focus on the on this part here on the, the fragmentation and the identification of peptide sequences. And for this, we have to go back to our childhood when we were all happily playing with these with these bricks, all colorful and just yeah you can really do whatever you want with these things and in our thought experiment we will put these bricks into sequences that are aligned like like these and my question to you is now can you distinguish these two sequences of lego bricks measuring them on the ms1 level so measuring the intact mass of these of these um, two sequences, can you distinguish them? No. Okay, there's one vote for no. Do we have opposite opinions? Okay, then everybody agrees that it's not possible to, to do this, and you're perfectly right. If we just look at them as the intact piece, right, they will have the exact same, same weight. So too bad for our mass spectrometer. However, we also know that we can <clears throat> just take whatever structure we built from Legos and just smash it on the floor. And in this case, we will do the exact same thing here um my question now is what what happens how do these things fall apart once we smash them on the floor nobody was playing with them as a kid no <laughs> Or maybe you have kids already that are doing this, and then you you step with your feet on these nice bricks. So would you expect that they break here? Let's say that this green brick breaks here if you if you drop it on the floor. Trypsin. Uh, break the protein in a specific side, believe, no? No, no, we, we're not at, we, that's no, already, okay. no, no, we are in the, in the mass pack and we're looking at, at peptides. And there indeed, you could think of peptides that were derived from, from a triptych digestion. But now, like the, the analogy I want to make is that these bricks can be amino acids. So, either think of sequences of, of lego bricks or think of sequence of, of amino acids in a, in, a, in a peptide but and maybe all these blocks would split separately mm -hmm. yes and that's really the key thing that the the blocks split but you do not break the blocks themselves right? so you have here these bonds between these blocks and it's actually the bonds that break um, but you don't break the actual the actual parts or, or units apart and because of this if you just do this often enough you typically observe something like this so-called letters of well, in our case, fragment ions. And you can now see if you now compare this left part to the right part, there is going to be fragment ions that distinguish these two sequences. And just like with these, these Lego bricks, um, <clears throat> the same principle applies also to peptides in MSMS experiments. So if we select peptide precursors in our mass spectrometer and guide them to the collision cell and let them collide, with, um, <clears throat> with our collision gas, the peptides will break apart. But the good thing for us and the good thing for proteomics is that 
they break apart in a well-defined uh, manner. And this is the, the, the entire basis of peptide sequencing by, by mass spectrometry, is that we know that the peptides um, typically break at this, this bond here. Let's see, the, the anally bond, and then there is this, this nomenclature that tells us that we, um, we term fragment ions that have the charge here on this residue, they're termed Y ions. <clears throat> and if the charge sits or remains on the, the other terminus, they're referred to as B ions. But what I want you to, to take home from this slide is that we, we have these building blocks and the building blocks do not break apart, <clears throat> but instead we break this, this peptide backbone. So we generate fragment ions that have mass differences um, of exactly one amino acid. So to test whether you really learned this now, I could give you this, this nice little challenge and ask you what is the sequence of this peptide? So this is um, a random MSMS spectrum that I took from, uh, from one of our experiments somewhere in the middle uh, of the, the experiment where one peptide precursor was isolated with the, the quadrupole sent to the collision cell. Um, this is the result of the experiment. So how would you approach this? <clears throat> or can you maybe identify one or two amino acids that belong to this peptide? Okay, the way you would approach this is because of this, you will look at differences between two peaks in this fragment ion spectrum. So you can calculate, for instance, the difference between 771 and 674. And this would give you a number, and then you can compare this number to this list here. That is a, our, our reference table that gives you <coughs> like. You see here all the, the amino acids, and each amino acid is listed here with its monoisotopic mass. So, so you could approach this, this problem by you know, checking which masses can you fit here uh, in between two, two peaks. I think it's Pauline. Where, where do you see it? Uh, Pauline is uh, 97, uh, the uh, 771 minus uh, 674 is about uh, 97. I think it's Pauline. Mm -hmm. We can check, and indeed, there was proline in this in this position. So you, you see, it is possible to, to do this. And if I would have given you more time, I'm, I'm absolutely sure you would have solved the complete sequence. Um, <clears throat> main problem is our mass spectrometers, are, mass spectrometers are now relatively fast and we easily acquire hundreds of thousands of these MS2 spectra in an experiment. So that would take quite some time to go through each spectrum manually. And luckily there is a lot of bioinformatics in, in proteomics. And I think one of the, the major things here is that um, nowadays we use search algorithms that compare these experimental spectra that we see here to theoretical spectra. And we can calculate theoretical spectra because we first of all know the protein sequence of our organism because the organism has been sequenced. So we, we know exactly which like what is the, the protein sequence and we also know that we use trypsin in our experiment so we can have an in silico tryptic digest of our entire proteome to have a list of all possible peptides and then we can go even one step further because we know how the peptides fragment in a mass spectrometer we can also calculate 
um, the theoretical masses of the fragment ions of the B and Y ions that we expect in this spectrum. And then we just need some, some scoring functions to, to compare how well the experimental spectrum fits to the theoretical spectrum. Okay, why, why am I telling you, you all of this? Well, because the MS2 information is really key to the proteomics experiment. And if we, we look at a proteome through the eyes of a mass spectrometer, it typically looks like this. So we have <clears throat> here are two dimensions, that is the retention time on the y-axis, and we have the mass or m over z axis on the, the x axis here in this in this panel here. And then you see all of these, these green dots, they represent signals detected by the mass spectrometer throughout this experiment. And all of these, um, yeah, like colorful rectangles, they represent features detected by the mass spectrometer. So these are isotope patterns where the, the software concluded that this is real signal. And we can also zoom in here in this little, little rectangle here. This is zoomed here in, in, in panel B, and you can appreciate how complex a proteomics sample typically looks like. So this is easily hundreds of thousands of these features that we can detect in a single run. And you can also look at them in, in three dimensions. You, you see all the individual peaks um, piling up. There is very large differences in their relative abundance. And all of these are potential peptides. But just measuring the MS1 mass alone will not allow us to identify these, these peptides per se, because we <clears throat> like the mass can be ambiguous as we've seen, seen before. So therefore, we need to acquire MS2 spectra in order to identify all of these peaks. And typically, the mass spectrometer is operated in a, in a so-called data-dependent acquisition mode, where the instrument is, is um, programmed to do exactly um, what I just described. <clears throat> so it will look for features or peaks in the MS1 level, and then target these automatically for MSMS -MS analysis. So that in the end, we acquire here an MSMS -MS spectrum for the gray peptide, another one for the blue peptide, for the red one, and for the, for the green one. So that is the, the basis of the, the so-called data-dependent acquisition mode. And if you, if you want, we can, can spend maybe five minutes and simulate proteomics experiment. Um, there is this, this beautiful tool here from the University of Southern Denmark um, that is called UMOS, how to understand my Orbitrap spectrum. And <clears throat> if you want, you can, can click on this, this link. I can also copy it to the, to the chat. And then we can have a look how we can can operate the mass spectrometer in, in this data dependent acquisition mode and maybe what are the parameters that are important for, for this acquisition. And I will, would like to, to <clears throat> maybe focus on these, these three different, different tasks and then we can briefly discuss it. I think we have about, yeah, maybe, maybe five, five minutes to just get a little bit of an, of an impression. Or maybe I'll leave the tasks open. See. See, so still see this.
Okay, have you found some time to look into this? So on the level from, from zero to 10, how much fun is it to simulate an arbitrary spectrum? <laughs> I see, see a trend towards zero. <laughs> it's good, but it took a time. It took a while to load. Okay. okay. Did you, <clears throat> yeah, I hope you, you still even, Though it took some some time to load, you you had some time to browse a little bit through the spectrum. Uh, my main question is actually referring to this part down here. So, did someone get to the to the point and can maybe explain what's what's going on here in this in this acquisition cycle? So the in the first step, it happened uh, MS1. And then depending on the setting, in this case was 15, top 15. We have uh, 15 uh, MS2. Uh, so it's the time is depending on this or on the setting, let's say. Uh, in which going to happen a new MS1, and that is that one, the one who define also the peak up, mm -hmm. scrolling up, it's possible to see that the peak is depending on, on it. So. Really cool. Okay, so if we would set this, for instance, to top 40, and we, we see here immediately the number of MS1 scans that are depicted here by these these dots, they get less because our acquisition cycle gets gets longer and longer. And in the Orbitrap analyzer, you can also choose the experimental resolution that you would like to, to see. <clears throat> and this is proportional to the transient time. So if we increase our resolution on the MS2 level from 15K to 13K, you would see here um, that the cycle time gets gets even longer. I think you're right that uh, it's it's lagging a bit. Maybe it's not used to having so many users at the same same time. Okay, see <clears throat> it here. We it, it finally updated, and you see here we are actually uh, really borderline to accurately describing this peptide illusion profile just because our Cycle time is now three seconds or so. Okay, but you perfectly described the, the principle of DDA data dependent acquisition. So we are always acquiring one MS1 scan. And then from this MS1 scan, the mass spectrometer would um, choose the top N um, ions. So in this case, you know, this could be one, two, three, four, five, and then go down all the way. And acquire MS2 spectra um, for all of these ions. And then in the next cycle, uh, it would try to go deeper and deeper into this into this spectrum. Okay, perfect. So this is a really, really cool acquisition mode. <clears throat> and indeed it has been the, I think the standard for proteomics for, for really long, 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 long time. Um, there's is, there is also a few, few downsides associated with, with this. And I think we don't have time to discuss all of them, but uh, one of them is that our mass spectrometer is actually never fast enough. So as we've seen just in the simulation before, right, we 
the MS2 takes time and there is only limited time available in our experiment. So what we often observe is something like, like this. So in this histogram here, the degree distribution shows all the isotope clusters or features, you know, all these, these colorful rectangles that I showed on, on a few slides before detected in this specific experiment. And then um, out of these, those that were identified as peptides by MSMS, <clears throat> they are colored in, in green. And those that were targeted for MSMS are colored in red. And you see here the proportion of those uh, targeted and identified is actually less than the overall number of peptides or peptide features that the mass spectrometer could potentially detect in our sample. So in other words, the, the complexity of the, the proteome sample is, is overwhelming to the mass spectrometer. And for this DDA acquisition mode, this introduces some kind of stochasticity um, because the mass spectrometer will not always pick the very same precursors, but especially in this range here, you know, it, it could more or less randomly pick one or another precursor, meaning that um, if we do the experiment repeatedly, we do not always fragment and identify the very same peptides in our experiments. The advantage is that then overall our coverage of the proteome increases. The disadvantage is that maybe it's, it's less reproducible. And <clears throat> one way um, to address this problem or an, is, is another acquisition strategy, so-called data independent acquisition or a DIA. And here the reasoning is that our mass spectrometer is anyways not fast enough to uh, acquire MSMS separately for all of these peptides. Let's just acquire MSMS for multiple peptides in parallel. So at the same time in the same spectrum. And then the way this here is is set up is that the mass spectrometer cycles through wider ranges of the M over Z um, range and acquires fragment ion spectra um, from all of these segments. And what's shown here is, is one segment here from M over Z 500 to 525. <clears throat> and you see here at the, the MS1 level, at the MS, MS level, um, that this peak or this, this window was fragmented again and again. So we keep the acquisition cycle the same in DIA. It's not depending on, on the data. And ideally you collect and detect fragment ions for the blue ion, for the blue peptides, for the gray peptides, and for the, for the red and green peptides in every acquisition cycle, at least once. So in this way, we, we generate multiple MSMS spectra for each peptide, and we can also use this um, to generate illusion profiles now also for the fragment ions. So that's the, the, the concept of, of DIA. And if you really want to learn more about DIA, I can highly recommend this tutorial review, which I think is, you know, it's, it's beautifully written, beautifully illustrated and contains everything you need to know to get started with DIA. So um, because I like it so much, I also just took a few figures from, from that, that paper that I would like to explain in the next, next five, five to 10 minutes or so. Um, but yeah, if you need more details, feel free to go back to this, to this tutorial. So this is again showing the, the schematic, how this works. So we have again one MS1 scan, and this is now followed by the segmented MS2 scans. So in this case, it's 32 MS2 scans um, that cover the entire MOZ range from 400 to 1200. So each segment here is 25 MOZ units wide, which is roughly 10 times wider than um, the window sizes you would use in DDA scans. So the advantage here is that you see um, every peptide or always, because you're always fragmenting the entire M or Z range in an acquisition cycle. The big downside is here is that our MSMS spectra are much more complicated. 
because they're so wide, we are now co-isolating multiple peptides at once, and we are generating highly multiplexed spectra. And this is not that easy to, to analyze. There's different ways and strategies to, <clears throat> to analyze such data. I think that the most common nowadays is the so-called spectral library approach, where you, in a separate experiment, acquire a spectrum library of all the expected peptides that you um, expect in your, your sample. And then rather than trying to identify all the MS2 spectra, you're turning this question around and you're rather asking, do I find evidence for a specific peptides in my sample? Um, in the end, the result is more or less the same. Um, it just changes a bit the way the data is actually treated and also the statistics behind, <clears throat> behind this, all of these, these procedures. Uh, we'll just quickly skip over this. Um, the way up or the, the reason I'm showing this is <clears throat> that while for, for DDA, I think um, this is now very well established and you know there's there's still many software options but they're all kind of more or less on the same the same level right all the models are very well well established uh, whereas for daa workflows especially if you're starting i think this can be quite confusing because there's so many different workflows and many different softwares and you know it's like every other year there's there's a new software coming on that market so this is really is still a highly active field. And this is all because the, the spectra are so complex. So it's really a challenge for, for the bioinformatics um, to, to analyze the AA data and confidently identify and quantify the peptides and, and proteins. But so far for the for the analysis, now I would like to take one one step back and go a bit more into the acquisition. So what the mass spectrometer is actually doing. And just like with the DDA example we've seen seen before, also if you would like to set up a DIA method, you have to take some um, experimental parameters in, into account. <clears throat> so one of them is, for instance, how you would like to cover the MOZ range. If you look at the MOZ distribution of triptych peptides, um, you will realize that they are more dense in this MOZ range from 400 to, to 800 maybe, and then less dense is this, this higher MOZ range. So you could conceive acquisition methods that take this into account and maybe work with a bit narrow windows here in this, this highly populated region. So the reasoning behind all of this is always that you have narrow isolation windows, which should make your MS2 spectra less complex. On the other hand, if you have too many windows, which should give you a high selectivity, um, we run into this problem that we've seen before, um, that our acquisition cycle just gets too long. And exactly the same picture, right? If we take too much time for the, for the acquisition, then we can no longer um, accurately quantify peptide illusion peaks. So these are the considerations you always have when you set up um, the AA methods. Um, and then there is tons, tons of, of variations of acquisition modes. And <clears throat> yeah, I, I really like them. Um, it's, it's really cool to yeah, try to think how they work and, and, and why they work. Um, in the end, all of them try to address this intrinsic problem of the AA that we have very complex spectra. So compared to, to DDA, where you have narrow isolation windows, uh, with DIA, with these wide isolation windows, <clears throat> it, it's, there's always multiple peptides in a, in a spectrum. And so there's different, very clever ways um, researchers try to operate the mass spectrometer to deconvolute these spectra. So one approach here for the Orbitrap mass analyzer is the so-called multiplex DIA where you still have larger windows in, in a given scan, but now you split um, this scan to multiple regions of the, of the MOZ range. 
another one is the so-called offset where you <clears throat> still have your 25 thompson or moz unit DAA windows, but now you alter the position of these windows from one scan to the other. And then the reasoning behind that is that if you see a fragment ion here in this part, but not in this part, you know that it must come from this MRZ range, which is just half of um, the, the original window. So this is still a very, very active field. And more recently, there was also <clears throat> approaches that actually went very far away from having these windows but rather than having defined windows they would just um, scan the quadruple very fast through the entire range so they don't have um, these fixed windows anymore but more of a yeah smooth transition through the entire MOZ range and something that that we are working on in, in our lab and, and what I started working on at the, the MPI in, in Martin Threed in Matthias Mann's lab uh, was introducing another dimension of separation in this workflow. And I think I just have like five minutes or so. Um, but I just want you to take home that the back part here is a regular QTOF. So this is what you yeah, maybe have seen seen before. The only thing that's different is that we have here this eye mobility analyzer. And the way this works, it's a <clears throat> very small device, like only 10 centimeters, and it can accumulate ions and you can release ions from this um, device as a function of their ion mobility. So separated by, by the size and shape of the ions in the gas space. And this, this trap and elute a mechanism is really what, what enables this so-called passive acquisition mode. Um, the reasoning here was that we, we can basically stop time for a while by, by capturing the ions in this TIMS device and letting them pass out one after each other. Um, we, we can synchronize it with this downstream MSMS analysis. What this brings you in terms is that you do not have to waste ions, but you can use the or at least a larger fraction of ions for your mass analysis. So this makes it a much faster and b much more sensitive than um, on a regular QTOF where you would not have this this eye mobility device here up front. And yeah, this is a bit how it how it looks then then in reality. So we still have this these MOZ windows, but now we place them in two dimensions. So we also have to consider the the eye mobility dimension to sample the entire ion population and yeah if you want to learn more we've written some <clears throat> some tutorials and reviews on this because yeah I, I get that this is rather complicated to to explain in just one or two two minutes um but really the the core idea behind this is that we use this ion mobility device as a yeah, temporary ion storage that allows us to to be much more more sensitive and efficient with the ions that enter the mass spectrometer. And you can either use this for full proteome analysis or just one very recent study that we we did. It works equally well also for phosphor <coughs> peptides. And the reason why I'm showing this, this slide here is because I think it, it shows very nicely one of the advantages of these data independent acquisition modes. And that is you can go very fast in your analysis. It's because you're now analyzing all of these ions in parallel. You're not really limited by the sequential speed of the DDA MSMS acquisition. Because pretty much like a like a CPU, you can do many things, or TPU, you can do many things in, in, in parallel. And here in this example here for fossil proteomics, this allowed us to, to shorten the, the LC time by by a factor of four without losing much of our uh, identified fossil peptides. So I think this is one of the key advantages of, of DAA. And the other one is that since the scan mode is very consistent and you're always doing the same, same thing again and again, um, also the reproducibility in replicates can be very high. So in this case, we, we just ran 10 technical replicates of the same sample. And as you would have hoped to see, 
uh, nearly all peptides were detected in, in 10 out of 10, 10 replicates. So the AA passive is cool, but this field is really rapidly uh, evolving and there is new ideas coming up um, yeah, at, at the speed of light, so to say. And I think just, just a few weeks ago, there was a bit of a culmination point um, where these two preprints appeared on, on BioArchive, um, basically leading to the next iteration of the AA passive <clears throat> scan modes. So just leaving this here to, to keep you alerted of, of new things to, to come that will further improve um, yeah, these, these acquisition modes. So with that, I think I gave you a really quick and rapid ride um, through the different ways you can acquire proteomics data. And I would like to use the last five minutes to recapitulate the main, you know, the main findings from, from today's um, lecture. And I would like to do this in, in this format. So if you click on this, this link, this will bring you to a, <clears throat> like, an, like an online notebook and we can fill this together and discuss um, what we've we've learned today Okay, so if everything works, you should now see the same screen as I do. And yeah, so the two main things we, we discussed today were these two acquisition strategies, DAA and DDA. And you know, just think what what, what we, we discussed now during the last last hour or so. And indicate with stars whether you think one of these strategies is superior um, in in any of these these categories so yeah i can give you one or two minutes to to do this yes and i see it's starting to to build up Cool. Thank you very much. Um, votes are in, and I see um, you, you learned a lot from this this lecture. So it's very good for me to to see that the the, the course concepts came came through. Um, there is also yeah, you're all of the same have the same opinion on these these things. There is no not much we need to to discuss. Um, I would I would agree um, the ease of of method setup is indeed a bit easier with, with DDA. I mean, you, there's a few parameters that you can, can tweak, um, but at least the, the choice of methods and different strategies is probably a bit higher now with DAA. Even 
though I must say, once you have a DIA method, you probably just don't change it and just go with it. So it's, I, I don't think it's as um, unbalanced, imbalanced as you, you've now depicted it here. But yeah, the trend I think is, is definitely in this, this way. And yeah, ease of data analysis, <clears throat> as we, we discussed, um, and I think this is still true that uh, for DDA, there are the more established workflows. And um, yeah, is, is still a bit of a nascent, nascent field um, with many, many different, different options. Um, Proteome coverage, I think it's now leading towards DAA, but you can still get a, a very high proteome coverage also with, with DDA. And it's it's actually still frequently used, for instance, if for, for <clears throat> experiments where you do multiplexing, chemical or isobaric multiplexing with, with um, TMT re reagents or, or similar. And um, especially if you do experiments like these, I would say proteome coverage is more or less, or can be very similar with both acquisition strategies. Um, one thing we like in, in the lab is going for short gradients and there I think DAA um, really, really shines and probably gives you a, a deeper proteome coverage. And selectivity, sensitivity, dynamic range, <clears throat> as you uh, perfectly visualized here is more or less the same. So I don't think there is a clear winner on on, on either side and reproducibility data consistency, just by the way um, DAA data is acquired, I think is, is rather on the side of, of DAA. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and making this such an active um, seminar. It was a great, a great pleasure. Um, yeah, if you have any remaining questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Florian, for this awesome lecture. Um, yeah, I hope there is still some time for some questions in a minute. Uh, I for sure have some. Um, but yeah, those of you who are going to take off, uh, just want to thank you for stopping by. And yeah, thanks again, Florian, for, for this awesome uh, lecture.